Thank you very much indeed, and, and thank you for the invitation to come and speak here today. And I'm pleased also to be able to attend something of the Global Research Council tomorrow. I, I was asked to speak about uh, excellence with impact, and of course this feeds in very nicely following the presentation we've just heard, which has talked very much about basic science and the impact that fundamental research can have, but of course ended up by talking about how we get from basic research to translation perhaps rather more rapidly than we've done in the past. What I'll do here is just reflect a little bit on the broad experience in Europe, but I will focus primarily on the context in the UK, if only because the impact agenda seems to have struck home in the UK pretty powerfully, and I think it's inter interesting to reflect on that. So the beginning of my message is that science delivers. Uh, the audience we have here probably doesn't need persuading of that. But there's a whole set of evidence that's been put together. As scientists, we may debate how strong this evidence is, but even so, a recent report in the UK suggests that for every one pound spent by the government on research and development, private sector research and development output rises by 20 pence per year in perpetuity. So it has very long-term effect. If we look at this evidence from the European Commission, here they make the case that much of the productivity gains come from innovation and that on average, those countries that invested more in research and innovation during the recent economic crisis that we've experienced have been the most resilient during that economic downturn. And we could point to many politicians who I think have listened to that message and have been persuaded by the value of science. Here's a fairly prominent politician who makes the strong case that science is more essential for our prosperity, our health, our environment, and our quality of life than it's ever been before. So I think, and we could use many other examples, we've heard many in the first presentation of the value of science, the case is really quite powerful that science delivers, science is the underpinning to uh, an innovation and, and innovation, of course, leads directly to economic growth. But despite that, we are in a situation where funding for science can be argued to be under threat. Obviously, we've been through an economic crisis in much of the world, so perhaps this is not a great surprise, but it does mean that as scientists, we have to continue to make the case. So here are a few brief examples. In the United States, uh, the Social scientists have been under threat from uh, conversations happening in the US House. And that reminds us that politicians may not value all types of science to the same degree. In Europe, the Horizon 2020 budget, a fantastic budget at 80 billion, and I think we all agree that we were very pleased to see that outcome. But even so, that budget was smaller than the equivalent FP7 budget, the budget beforehand. And we've recently heard of President Juncker's plans for a European Fund for Strategic Investment, which of course may be a very wise strategy, but is likely or may indeed reduce the Horizon 2020 budget even further, and we find out in a few days. And if you look at national investment, public funding in science, you can see quite a lot of variability, certainly across Europe and indeed across the world. The UK, for example, is now in the unenviable position of having less than 0.5% of GDP being invested in science. And you can see here that for the G8 as a whole, for major countries like the United States, Canada, and indeed the UK, there have been some falls in the government funding to, so, towards science in recent times. And remember, this is the percentage of GDP, not just a fall in absolute numbers. So there are some threats to science in that context. And it raises a whole set of questions. How do we respond to that? How do we persuade politicians and funders that we must continue to invest at the same proportion in science, if not even more? And I think this raises all sorts of questions that we as scientists have, and indeed perhaps the funding agencies that are here have to respond to. Does economic austerity force us to reassess the value of science? Is the value of science taken for granted by some academics? How much academic research is truly valuable? Obviously, in any line of work, there'll be some research perhaps that's not. How should we measure the public value? How should we publicize that public value? 
And should we measure the impact? And if so, how? And that's one of the questions that's been grappled with quite a lot in the UK. <clears throat> As a further backdrop, though, we also need to think about public confidence in science. So here are a couple of quotes from The Economist, a leading magazine. This is the front cover of an, uh, an issue of The Economist, which points to the idea that science is going wrong. And here they talk about a biotech firm that found that it could only replicate a few of the studies in cancer research that had been heralded as landmark studies. There's also examples in there about the number of patients involved in clinical trials, but clinical trials where the research was later retracted because of mistakes. And The Economist goes on to argue that one reason for this is the competitiveness of science, and that nowadays verification, or what Nature magazine and others would talk about as reproducibility, the ability to reproduce findings, is something perhaps that doesn't advance many academics' careers. They're all looking for the new discovery, and there's perhaps less attention to replicating research as often as we should. Another element of this comes in this case. This is The Guardian, a major national newspaper, which talked about a study which has uncovered a possible cause of Alzheimer's disease just a few weeks ago in the UK. And the research was therefore heralded as offering hope of finding new treatments for dementia. Exciting new research and actually, I think, extremely valuable research. There's no question about that. But it's interesting to see the way The Guardian responded to that. So having reported it on April the 15th, on April the 17th, The Guardian put out an opinion piece which talked about the caveat that, of course, that research had been conducted on mice. And we're a long way from discovering whether or not that research could actually work in humans. And the interesting article that they put out raised the question of whether the media is prone to overhyping some of the cutting edge research that we conduct. So I think this raises some interesting questions for us as scientists and us as funding agencies. We need to think carefully about how we conduct, but importantly, how we report science. Reproducibility is, is a serious issue. And how we value and fund such work needs careful attention. But also, we need to think about how we engage with the media. We know in the UK that Climate Gate at the University of East Anglia was an interesting lesson for us all. So one of the issues might be that we need to be able to explain better to the media the stage at which our research is at. How much do we herald as new, exciting advances? And perhaps something like a traffic light system that explains that some research is very, very fundamental and new, and other research is perhaps more widely tested, and some research has got to the stage where its reproducibility is confirmed, and hence might be treated rather differently. So how have governments and funding agencies responded? Well, this is a long quote from Ben uh, Bernanke from the US Federal Reserve previously. And he talks in this quote about why it's essential for the government to fund basic research. The problem, of course, is that this will not be funded in any other way. There are certain types of research that require government funding because it's impossible almost for the private sector to come uh, forward with funds for that type of research. And this raises an interesting question at the heart of our discussion, I suppose, between basic and applied research, which is what should the balance be from government funding for pure and applied research? And this also raises interesting questions about how well we can distinguish between pure and applied. There is certainly some research which undoubtedly is extremely fundamental, and there's also some extremely applied research, but there's also an awful lot of research that falls somewhere between the two. And it raises the question of whether we can easily distinguish between these. Much research is, research is at the interface. And in fact, of course, a lot of applied research uh, uses both basic and applied input to real world problems in imaginative ways. Many researchers, of course, are doing their research in the first place because they want to make a difference. They want to be involved in translation. They want to take their ideas and have a difference. So it does raise the interesting question, at least, of whether this, what we often interpret, often talk about, as a kind of binary divide between pure and applied research, whether it's really helpful. Another question is what the balance should be between bottom-up and top-down research. So bottom-up research is the research where the academic comes up with the idea and accesses funds from a funding agency, much as we heard from the NSF, and indeed that's a common practice in most funding agencies. 
But there are also many funding agencies which are a little bit more top-down. They steer the research. They focus the research. They ask academics to respond to p particularly important questions. Of course, these bottom-up and top-down approaches can also be distinguished in many ways, but they're not easily distinguishable in other ways. We often incorrectly assume that bottom-up schemes will necessarily uh, will always produce basic outputs, while top-down schemes will always produce applied outputs. Bottom-up schemes, of course, often fund applied research. And how we steer research is crucial. Many funding agencies do steer research, but they involve the academics in helping to decide what those steers should be, and those steers are often rather loose. So in fact, although it may be steered towards a grand societal problem, it isn't steered so that academics are constrained too tightly. So this distinct distinction between bottom-up and top-down needs some thought. So then how do we measure excellence or excellent research with impact? How do we judge the impact of our research? Well, here's a quote from the European Science Foundation saying that we can measure traditional outputs, patents, uh, quality of peer-reviewed articles quite well, but we need to think harder about a more holistic picture of research outputs such as influences on policy and, and practice. In the UK, Research Councils UK define impact in this way. They argue firstly that impact can be instrumental, i.e. more applied. It can be conceptual, of course, fundamental research and come up with conceptual new ideas, or capacity building. One of the biggest impacts we have as funding agencies can be to fund the growth of scientists through PhD training and other sorts. So here they define what they mean by academic impact and what they mean by economic and social impact. And in RCUK language, at least, it's not about predicting impact. You don't have to say what the impact of your research will be. You just have to explain how the pathway or what the pathways are that you will use to try and engage users and get people interested in your research. So here are just a set of examples on the left in orange, the sorts of things that lead to academic impacts, and in green, the sorts of things that lead to economic and social impacts. And in the UK, at least, Research Councils UK is responsible both for funding fundamental research and for funding research, which will be more translational. The second element of funding in the UK comes from HEFGI, the Higher Education Funding Council. So we have two broad ways of funding science. It's through our research councils, but also through HEFGI, who assess every academic department in the country. And for the first time in the recent assessment in 2014, you can see they looked at the quality of research outputs, so what are the peer-reviewed papers like for every academic department in the country. They looked at the research environment, what sort of infrastructure is in each department so we can assess how good a department is, but also they looked at the impact. So for every 10 researchers, they had to write a case study of the sorts of social and economic research impact that that department had had. And here, although it's not very clear, you can see the correlation between the academic peer review papers, which are judged between a score of 1 and 4, or 0 and 4, and the quality of the impact. And you can see there's a correlation, but it's not direct. Some of the departments were good at academic impact, and some were better at social and economic impact. Another point to remember if we're thinking about that is that, of course, impact is not just about technological impact. We saw from some of the examples at NSF uh, technological but also other sorts of impact. The language of NASA's technology readiness levels with us since I think the 1980s really now needs to be criticized a little bit because of its linear approach to understanding impact and the temptation to think that impact of science is predominantly more to do with technology. In fact innovation is far more interdisciplinary. We heard about for example some of the social science impacts from NSF uh, f if you look at the United Kingdom, 79% of our economy now is service sector. Something like uh, the creative economy, which is one part of that, grew 6% between 2011 and 12, when the overall economy only grew by less than 1%. So in fact, in our uh, nation, uh, the sorts of things where we need innovation most are not always in the technological field. Of course we need both. We must remember the importance of the service sector, including things like the creative economy. So we need a change in culture so that the language of innovation is more recognizing that we need uh, STEM skills, but also other skills as well. And finally, just as an example, this is often quoted as a 
a great example of where impact can be both fundamental and applied. So if you take this example in the UK, this was the third generation mobile phone license auction. I think these auctions have happened in a number of countries since. This is where previous approaches have used what was traditionally called a beauty contest approach to allow companies to bid for these 3G licenses. And this work by an academic in one of the ESRC funded centers looked at game theory and introduced a different approach, an auctioning approach. The auction was predicted to raise 2.5 billion pounds. It actually raised 22.5 billion pounds, which is 2.5% of GNP. So the game theory, the fundamental research he did on game theory, and indeed many other researchers alongside him in other countries, helped in the end to uh, deliver a very applied piece of work which had a big impact on the British economy. So in conclusion, these are the things I underlined during the talk, and I raise a lot of them for debate rather than conclusion because I think they, they deserve at least an airing. Should we measure impact? And if so, how? And by that I mean, should we measure the economic and social impact of our work? And if so, how? Do we need some sort of system for engaging with the media so we can be clear about the results that we're producing, at what stage the research is at? Is this binary divide between pure and applied research helpful? It probably is in some ways, but there is certainly research which falls somewhere in between the two. And how steers are decided in what we call top-down schemes is, in my mind, crucial. If steers are too narrow, that could be very detrimental. On the other hand, broadly defined steers can be very valuable to governments who are funding uh, the funding agencies in the first place. It's not, of course, about predicting impact per se, but about resourcing pathways through which impact may happen by engaging with users. And we need to think about the culture of innovation, the language we use about technological and other types of innovation, so that, yes, of course, we support STEM education. Yes, of course, we support STEM science, but we mustn't forget that a lot of innovation is required in a whole set of other disciplines as well. Thank you very much indeed.